Welcome to Motivated to Lead Podcast, helping you become a better leader. I'm your host, Mark Klingsheim. Hi, everyone. Thanks again for joining us for our podcast this week. My name is Mark Klingsheim with SEMA Partners. Each week, we interview leaders and they share lessons learned from their careers. Our goal is to help you become a better leader. This week, we're happy to revisit a conversation that we had uh, some time ago with Ross Jaffe. Ross is a uh, physician by training and he uh, practiced medicine. Uh, he went into the uh, venture capital world. He was uh, recognized on the Forbes Midas list of leading venture capitalists. Uh, he has worked with numerous companies and leaders and uh, has served on a number of boards. And uh, he has some great insights around uh, leadership and lessons learned in his career, as well as watching the careers of uh, many executives. And uh, he's uh, got some great thoughts to share. Looking forward to our conversation with Ross. Uh, we're very happy to have with us uh, Ross Jaffe. And, and uh, Ross, I guess, first off, can you give us just a little bit of your overview of your, your uh, career, your story? Yeah, I'd be glad to, Mark. And it's a pleasure to be here. I appreciate your inviting me. Um, I am, I, um, I'm a physician by training, actually. I was, um, I was pre-med in college, and, but had real interest in public policy, and so uh, merged those two by focusing on health policy in the late 70s, when it wasn't such a hot topic as it is now. After a little stint working in Washington for a health policy consulting firm, I went to med school at Johns Hopkins, and then, um, and then got the idea that I also wanted to get a business degree at some point, but I actually put that off uh, until after my residency. I came out to San Francisco to do my residency at UC San Francisco in the height of the AIDS epidemic, which was a really interesting place to train, one, sure. of, one of the prior pandemics. And then I, um, after residency, went down to business school. And I really thought I'd come out and be some, doing something in the healthcare world, uh, health policy, healthcare administration. Um, but by accident, I... Uh, ended up in the venture capital industry as one of the first physicians. I got a call mm -hmm. when I was in business school, um, a VC firm um, had gotten my name from one of my professors. It was a time when healthcare investing was really taking off here in the Valley um, in 1990. And um, they were looking for someone with a healthcare background to help the generalists in venture capital who were trying to do more and more healthcare. And so it was just, you know, it's life, a lot of life is being, it's better to be lucky than smart. I just happen to be at the right place at the right time to be one of the early physicians in the industry. That was with a firm called Brentwood Venture Capital, where I became a partner a few years later. And, um, and then in the late 90s, um, the height of the internet boom, a lot of firms who were doing both IT and healthcare decided healthcare was the old, old economy. And you know, the internet was the new, new economy. They only wanted to focus on the internet. So several of us spun out of Brentwood and merged with um, other healthcare people from two other firms to form Versin Ventures, which is now one of the larger healthcare focused venture capital firms here in the US. And um, so I've really been doing venture investing for the last 30 years. Mm -hmm. um, my area, well, I've done investing in biotech and healthcare service, healthcare IT. I really focused on medical technology and uh, have been doing that up until about four or five years ago when I stepped back from active investing to pursue some other activities. One of the questions I like to ask uh, each of our guests is, if knowing what you know now, if you were able to spend back time and, and talk to a 22-year-old Ross, uh, what advice would you, would you give him? Um, well, the first thing I'd probably tell him is be less anxious. I was always worried, you know, I, I always worried about making sure I performed well and, and um, I realized I spent so much of my life more stressed than I really need to be, that if I had just done, worked hard and used my abilities, I would be fine as I turned out to be. So uh, um, I really, um, I joke that in, you know, after in my mid to late forties, I started losing my anxiety drive, you know, which I think drives a lot of us. I think anxiety sure. drives a lot of uh, high performance. Uh, but I, um, you know, wish I had had a little less anxiety, could have enjoyed life a little bit more. But um, again, um, other than that, I think I've really had an incredibly fortunate um, career. And, and uh, like I said, it's always better to be lucky than smart. And I've been fortunate to have a lot of good luck. Is there any advice that you received uh, back when you were younger that you wish you would have ignored? 
Um, not really that I wish I'd ignored. I got some good advice. Um, one of my early mentors, the man who, one of the people who hired me into Brentwood, used, used to say that so much of life is knowing what not to do and what not to focus on so you can focus on the more important things. And um, I wish I heed that a little bit more because uh, I think sometimes I focus on things I didn't need to be doing. But, um, you know, figuring out what's really important and, and, and knowing what you don't have to do, you can let others do, trusting others to do things, I think is um, really important. You don't have to do it all yourself. And um, um, so that would, you know, that would be something. Um, and the other thing I, you know, learning to be a really good team member, it's hard in venture capital because you're really, I joke that um, while companies are like baseball teams where everybody plays a different position and you have, you know, a general manager who the CEO is trying to make everybody perform well, um, venture capital traditionally has been more like tennis teams where everybody plays singles and adds up the score at the end of the day. And um, I don't think it traditionally promotes great team behavior. And I think in the end, what you really need for organizations like um, venture capital firms that have um, where you're, you know, you've got to lead a deal, you've got to be the board member. It's really going to play more like basketball teams where you, you know, you try to help get the, the ball to the right person to score in that situation. And sometimes it's you and sometimes it's other people, but you've got to, you know, help your teammates be successful. And, and that's really the goal. And um, um, it took, you know, it, there's no, there was no, when I was coming through, there was no playbook, but I think that's really a um, an approach we tried to take at Burst and I'm doing some work for NEA. I think they do a very good job on that of really trying to help everybody be successful at what you do. So you've done a lot of work with uh, helping companies as they're getting uh, set up and started. And you've hired a lot of people over the years as far as of looking at CEOs as well as uh, senior leadership teams. Um, maybe somebody that, you know, is, is doing this for the, the first time or, you know, maybe new in that, uh, that seat where they're having to put together a team. What are some things that you look for as you're, as you're hiring people? You know, it's interesting. You know, most people... Um, focus on, you know, experience in the role, you know, role experience, and then domain expertise, which is knowing the, you know, the, the area that the company is playing in very well. And so, um, and I think both of those things are important. Uh, and you vet that by looking at people's experience, their career, how they've come up. Um, and clear that role experience, having, you know, knowing that you have, knowing that they can take on and know what to do in that role and also um, the domain expertise, the more they know about the specific area they're playing in, the better they're gonna be. But the one area that often I don't think it's enough attention is judgment. And um, judgment is really how you make decisions in the face of uncertainty. You know, if the answer is clear, that doesn't involve any judgment. But when the answers are unclear, knowing how to get to the right answer or a good answer for the organization is really, really critical. And good judgment is something that um, can't be taught, but you have to learn and you have to develop. And I think people often focus on their knowledge in, of, a, of, of a role or knowledge of a field and don't think about, am I making good decisions? How do I make good decisions? And so when I interview someone, I'm not only looking for that role and domain knowledge, I'm really trying to probe on situations where they've um, either had a lot of uncertainty or been thrown a curveball. Um, and how did they handle those situations and how did they react and respond? Um, so much of building these small companies, I joke that in a small company, there are a thousand ways they can fail and a very few ways they succeed. And there are a thousand little things that come up that you've got to make judgments about in, in every role, particularly the CEO role. And so to probe on people how to do that, when things, you know, there are these random events that come up and when they cut our way, you call them good luck. And when they cut against you, you call them bad luck. But really whether they're good or bad is sort of how you react to them and what you make of them. And um, when I, you know, I've seen um, CEOs who are very, have good judgment 
have a, you know, a, a random event happen, a curveball thrown at them, and they figure out how to wall it off and deal with it and not have it derail the organization, where I've seen lesser CEOs, poor judgment, wallow in that and have it really take the company down. Similarly, I've seen opportunities arise when the company's going down one path and something comes up, the really good CEOs will see the opportunity of that and pivot where I've other seen other groups just keep plowing on the direction they're doing and not recognizing the opportunity before them. So this issue of judgment, it's, it's a hard thing to judge judgment. It's a hard thing to determine. But I think that people demonstrate during the course of their career, um, when confronted with situations, how they react and respond. And so um, those are, um, you know, that's really something that I probe for and try to understand. And then the other last thing, of course, in addition to ability to do the role in domain judgment, it's just how they work with other people. You know, life's too short to deal with difficult people. Um, you want to, people want to work in environments where they feel like they're respected and treated with respect. And so you want to have people who have good interpersonal skills, I think, in those roles as well. So talk a little bit about Maybe in your own experience, when you talk about judgment and having clarity, uh, when the wheels have fallen off, are there some questions that you uh, kind of ask yourself as you're trying to sort out uh, kind of a, a situation where things haven't gone, you've gotten a curveball? Uh, what are some things that you've done as far as to kind of get clarity? Well, you know, one of the things is how you sort of initially react to things. And some people are much more reactive and emotional um, I tend to sort of say, okay, I have, I'm having this reaction. Let me could quell it and sit back and think. There's a, there's a famous uh, novel in medical circles called The House of God. It was written in the early 70s about internship at, um, at Mass General, one of the hospitals in Boston. And um, there are these rules of the House of God. And I've never forgotten rule three of the House of God, which is the first thing you do at a code is take your own pulse. And um, I think that's true in all these situations. When a situation, you know, surprises you or suddenly gets really difficult, the first thing you do is sort of assess where you are and calm yourself down and start focusing and not just reacting. Um, and then you've got to figure that um, um, I also have the analogy that most of life is like golf. You've got to play the ball where it lies. You can be upset about how you got there, but that doesn't matter at this point. What really matters is what do I do from this point going forward to get myself into the best situation I can be to make the best out of this. And it may be that there's nothing good you can do. You, there may be nothing you can fix. And, um, but you just have to do the best you can. You know, I encountered this a lot in my residency training during the AIDS epidemic when we didn't have any therapies really yet. And, um, you know, patients had a bad disease and you as a doctor couldn't fix them. So the question is, how did you help them deal with the remainder of your life as gracefully as possible. And I think um, you've got to decide in every situation what the real options are and then make the best judgment you can about them and, and go forth with that and not tr continually second guess yourself. So, um, you know, it's that calmness. It's really trying to assess what the real options are, what the practical options are, and, it's, and then making decisions, say, okay, we're going forward with this and we'll deal with the consequences and do the best we can. What are some of the, the mistakes that you see uh, maybe first time CEO make? Uh, is there a kind of a pattern that you've seen as far as uh, for those that are listening to this podcast, a number of them are maybe in, in that first CEO role or they're maybe a little bit later in their career, but uh, anything that you've seen as a pattern that uh, people need to, to be aware of? Well, one is, you know, when you're in your first CEO role, you often feel you've got to prove yourself. And in doing that, you have to feel like you're the one who has to solve all the solutions and that somehow asking for help is a sign of weakness. Hmm. And um, I view the ability to ask for help, to take in other thoughts uh, as a sign of security. It's insecure people have trouble doing that. Secure people have no problem asking other people for their thoughts or their help and admitting what they know and don't know. And so you know, from my mind, you know, and looking at uh, and thinking about some other situations, um, this insecurity, this sense that I've got to fix it, I don't want to show that I don't know the answer here, is really a bad reaction. The, you know, 
the best, well, some of the best CEOs I know ask other people a lot for their thoughts and their help. But then they know they've got to make a decision and they, they're very clear that we're the, you know, they're going to make the decision, they're going to go forward and deal with this. They really want to get that diversity of, of opinion. And that's the other aspect of it. You, it helps to have a diversity of perspectives on things. It's rare. We're all, I always joke that we're all victims of our own experience. You know, we all see the world from where we've come. And sometimes it's very helpful to see things from other people's perspectives that gives you a broader perspective, help you come to a better overall solution. And that's the value of diversity in boardrooms. That's the value of diversity in teams. And again, to get the most out of that diversity, you have to be very secure about who you are and then and, and, tr and create an environment of trust so those other people will share their perspectives and collectively you'll, you'll come up with a better answer. And so um, in my mind, that, that need to feel like you've got to do it yourself, not to sort of bring in the team, not to be able to share, that's really a, a challenge I've seen for first-time CEOs. You mentioned about working with the board, and that's one of the uh, – probably the adjustment that somebody moving from a, a role, maybe they were a CFO or another functional role, and all of a sudden now they're, uh, they're reporting to the, the board or working with the board. Uh, what advice would you give? You've been a, a board member on, on numerous boards as well as uh, uh, have seen uh, different leaders in those situations, but anything that you would give as far as advice working with boards? Yeah, I think that um, it's interesting. Um, a lot of people are used to managing up to one person, right? They're used to managing up to their, the person they report to. And all of a sudden you go into a boardroom and you've got five to seven to nine, 10, you know, people that are your quote unquote reporting to, but they're not directly there every day. And they're not engaged in the way that your manager usually is, who's in the business all the time. So it takes extra effort and it takes extra, um, you know, thought to figure out how to get the best out of your board. But uh, you've got to view your board as another resource for success not as a weight around your neck that you've just got to keep up. And I've seen the worst situations where the CEO, you know, acts like the board is just a, another pain in the ass he has to deal with, as a, or he, she has to deal with, as opposed to a situation in which you've, you know, you can get value out of your board. And the CEO needs to strategically think about the board and work with the leading board members, whoever they are, to make sure they get the right people around the table. In many situations, you're, you're going to have a bunch of investors around the table because they've basically put their money in the company and they want to be involved. And so you've got to, you know, deal with that. And there are often different personalities, but you've got to try to figure out how to get the best out of each of them. And then the important thing that I think often gets short shrift is how you bring on the board really good independent people who are going to give you good perspective, bring really good expertise or domain knowledge to the table, and uh, are people who you can get value out of in trying to, you know, deal with these thousand issues that are come up as you run your company. Mm. And um, um, I think thinking strategically and, and thinking about the board as a resource and something you need to think out and get the most out of is really the right mindset as opposed to thinking about a, a, as a burden. So we're, we're living kind of in some unusual times uh, with everybody. We talked a little bit before we started the podcast that everybody's kind of in the same boat dealing with COVID and, and yeah. everything that's going on in our, our world. Uh, what, what advice would you give leaders that as they're kind of, again, going back to that uncertainty uh, aspect of it, uh, any, any advice that you'd give somebody leading during this time? Well, you know, coming back to what I talked about before, that, you know, COVID is just a random event, okay. right? It's, it's something you would have never expected and was, or very few people would have expected and was something that was hard to plan for because we've never seen, a, 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 even in other pandemics, we've never seen something that has such a widespread effect um, and um, for which we've had to, you know, really restrict people's activities. But this, like anything else, in, is a... Um, there, you know, in every problem, there are usually opportunities as well, and usually opportunities for change, because there's a certain inertia we all get in what we're doing, that sometimes it takes a shock to the system to force you to rethink. And I've seen even the portfolio companies, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm on eight boards right now, and they have a ninth the company that I've co-founded, and I've seen in several of them, 
where coming out of COVID, I think we're going to be much stronger companies mm. because of changes, because of rethinking we've had to do. We've had to look at, we've had to examine every aspect of the business. We've got to figure out where every dollar is being spent. Uh, we've got to figure out what every role is. And um, there are some new, you know, efficiencies that have come out of it. There's some new thinkings about how can we access customers more efficiently now that we can't meet with them on a regular basis. I think the use of, you know, clearly in medicine, the use of telehealth is here to stay. I think in business, the use of teleconferencing like we're doing now is here to stay in ways that it wouldn't have been but for this, ep this epidemic. So, um, and it is really um, these types of challenges that really prove, um, you know, test teams but really prove who's got the chops to really uh, create, you know, go, move, go through the businesses. So it tells you a lot about your people and how they respond. Um, and, and so I think there are real opportunities in this uh, when you look for it. Now, there's some businesses, I've got one that I'm doubtful is going to survive, you know, just because of, you know, the impact on its business. There's several others who adapted early. I think the companies that reacted the earliest and really made hard choices early are really doing the best now. Mm -hmm. And uh, those companies that delayed and, and um, tried to deny that it was going to be as big a deal as it was are ones that uh, are in more trouble. Fortunately, I don't have any of those because I was really on them about, you know, how important this was, both from my medical point of view as well as my uh, business point of view. Um, but I do think that, um, you know, for all the challenges, there's some really interesting changes in business and positive changes in business that are going to occur coming out of this epidemic. So you you have your your hand on the pulse of as a doctor. That's a terrible pun, but uh, you you know what's going on in healthcare. But uh, it, what are what's exciting you about kind of as you look out uh, on the horizon with with healthcare and and what's going on? Uh, any trends that you think are going to be uh, definitely impactful as far as uh, in that that area? You know, when I was more actively investing, when everybody, whenever anybody would uh, ask me about that, it reminded me of skiing on a powder day. Um, <laughs> and I had this instructor friend, uh, and he and I would go out skiing uh, on a powder day. And because he had the red jacket on as an instructor, people would come up to him and say, oh, where should we go? And he'd always be pointing where we had been because he didn't <laughs> want to give up the fresh powder that we were sure. going to hunt, that we were on the hunt to find. Um, so you have to be suspicious when you ask a VC that question, if they're going to tell you really where they're <laughs> But, you know, I'm, I, I can be a little more open about it now. Um, look, it is a phenomenal time in uh, medicine and healthcare in general. Um, and I think, you know, you can look in every aspect. Um, you know, the science and the evolution of science is phenomenal. We're seeing that play out in the biotech industry in this really long, sustained um, up market that we've had in both the public and the private markets is really based on the fact that just so much potential to really make, continue to make a great difference in health, in, in, in medicine through, through the biopharma side. Um, on the med tech side, um, you know, some of the areas, um, you know, the challenge in med tech is you, you, as you sort of solve one problem with a set of tools, there aren't as, you know, it's a, the problems to solve get narrower and narrower. But I do think um, there are real opportunities, especially as we gain more insight into physiology. I have a hierarchy of opportunity in med tech that I talk about um, where, you know, the best opportunities are when somebody comes up with a, just a, you know, a new area of, of using a device that we've never thought of before. And there are areas out there like um, I think some of the neurostem stuff and, and using set point medical is a good example where you're, um, and I'm not involved in that company. I'm just blown and very impressed how they can modulate the vagus nerve and use that to modulate the immune system. I mean, that's, you know, it's a device acting as a drug. Mm -hmm. um, even in areas where we have existing technology, when there's a new insight in physiology, you can often open up new areas as we've done in renal, de renal denervation for hypertension. Um, and then even within places where you've got you know, no new insights in physiology is existing, just some careful thinking about how to do better ways of doing the same procedure um, is another area. Um, and then, of course, there are new materials and um, 
new manufacturing techniques that allow us to take existing technology and make it better and better and better. And then the final area is that whenever the government changes regulations and um, or whenever the environment of healthcare changes, there are new opportunities. And I think we're going to see that play out in home, you know, the shift to more telehealth, the more shift to more home management is going to create a bunch of opportunities for devices and technology that are really suited to managing patients in the home. So you've got that, you know, you've got the sciences trends, you've got the, you know, what's going on in med tech trends. And then in the health service delivery, you know, there's just going to be a constant move to move patients to the least costly setting with the least skilled provider to try to save money. And that creates opportunity for very innovative new models and particularly models for managing chronic disease. We've done a great job over the last 30 years of really improving the treatment of acute disease. But it's these management of the chronic disease, the diabetes, the hypertension, Alzheimer's, um, you know, arthritis, those areas that are really going to, I think, help improve healthcare costs as well as quality of life for the patients. So I see a target rich environment out there. Um, doesn't mean any of it's easy because it takes time and a lot of money to, to build these businesses, but there are a lot of opportunities out there. Great. Um, as you uh, are talking with leaders, are there any books that you recommend uh, for, for leaders that you're talking to or some that are your favorite that you'd recommend to somebody to read? You know, um, interesting. I'm not a big fan of a lot of business books because I think so many people develop a hypothesis about something and then search around for the data to support the hypothesis and ignore the data that doesn't. So I, I look at some of these, I read some of these occasional business book and I, I don't uh, find it helpful. The one that I think is just everybody in, in a leadership role should read is Good to Great by Jim Collins. It's a, you know, it's been around for 20 plus years now, but it's just such a thoughtful piece. And it's based on really empirical research about really looking at what drives very successful companies. And his discussion of a level five leader and what that's about, his discussion of the Stockdale paradox of, you know, the difference between optimism and long-term confidence, um, I think is really, is really, so there's some valuable concepts in that book, the flywheel effect. It's, it's a really excellent book. Um, the other book that um, I found helpful is not really a business book, but I just, I am always fascinated by how people think. And one of my areas of real interest these days is what's going on in neuroscience. And, 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 um, and I'm, there's, you know, the classic in that area is, is um, Thinking Fast and Slow by Kahneman, um, who did all the work, he and Amos Tversky uh, did so much of the important psychology work to really elucidate how we think. And it's, we have these two systems, the, you know, the intuitive mind that reacts very quickly, which is where we, which, where we focus most of our time. And then this rational override that we have that can be a rational override or just a rationalization for our intuitive mind. But understanding how the brain work I, works is just, I think, so helpful to understanding people and how they behave. Um, and, you know, if you want a quick version of that, you can read Malcolm Gladwell's Blink, which is sort of built on the same concepts, but that's the uh, second one. And then the other book that um, I'm fascinated by, particularly in the current times, where we're all, there's so much political division in the country, is a book called The Righteous Mind, uh, Why Good People Differ on Religion and Politics, by a guy named Jonathan Haidt, H-A-I-D-T. And he builds on... Um, the thinking fast and slow work with some additional work research that he's done in social psychology, talking about what the real origins are of conservatism versus liberalism and how it's not, they're not rational things. These are sort of hardwired embedded or at least embedded uh, reactions we have to things. And, and um, once you understand that and you can bring your rational mind to really looking at these things, a lot of those divisions I think can be knocked down. So, those are three very different books, but things that are, have just sort of shaped my frame of how I think about the world. Yeah, we're always looking for suggestions and, and definitely uh, appreciate that. What, uh, outside of work, uh, what do you do to kind of recharge? <laughs> well, I, you know, I certainly have my wife and my kids are grown, but we try to interact with, you know, see them as much as we can. Oh, it's been hard in the pandemic. We're doing yep. a lot of video conference. Um, 
But uh, I've always, you know, I try to work out and stay in great shape. I think the older you get, the harder you have to work to stay where you were. And, um, and um, I think it's really important, though, to, um, you know, stay in shape and watch what you eat, you know, as you get older. Um, I've, you know, I play a lot of tennis in my life. I've skied a lot. Uh, for, a num- for a number of years now, I've been racing cars. Huh? And um, although I haven't been able to be in a race car in the last year or so for because of a health issue, I really love that. Um, I always joke that I can't really relax unless I'm doing something life-threatening. <laughs> what I mean by that is that, um, you know, being a venture capitalist where you're involved, you know, you're spread really wide on a lot of different issues. Um, it's really hard to, hard to turn the mind off. And there's always something that you can be thinking about and focused on and worrying about. And I found even in my tennis as I got older, which is harder to concentrate between, you know, keep the concentration up between points because I start thinking about the kids or work or something else. But I find when I'm skiing down a ski slope or, or, um, or racing on a racetrack that I got to be totally in the moment. And that's some ways relaxing. So um, it's, it's a, it seems counterintuitive, but uh, I think those, you know, stressful sports are sometimes more relaxing in a weird way. So what kind of car do you drive? What is your my daily driver or my race car? No, your 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 race your race driver. <laughs> um, I raced open wheel cars for about a decade in the Skip Barber Racing School. Um, okay, and uh, but then I shifted over into sports cars and have been racing mainly Lotuses, which are a British sports car. I raced a Lotus Elise for a number of years, um, and my current car is a Lotus Evora, um, two seater British sports cars. Okay, that incredible handling cars and uh, really fun to drive. Cool. Very cool. Any uh, parting advice that you give somebody as they're, they're in their, their career? What, what, uh, what advice would you give? Well, the only thing I would say is that, you know, I look back and I realize these, your career is really a marathon, not a sprint. And you've got periods of very intense work along the way. Um, but you should pick up your head every once in a while and sort of think, you know, where am I going? Where do I want to be spending my time? The older I've gotten, and now that I'm, you know, in my early 60s, I I'm really focused on something I call QTR, which is quality time remaining. You know, I've, you know, you start to realize that whereas when you're really young, it seems like a long time, it really does go by quickly. And, and you, you know, your kids grow up more quickly than you expect. Um, you age more quickly than you expect. And you want to make sure you're enjoying life along the way, as well as really thinking about what's important to you over the long term. And uh, it's easy to get caught up in just focusing on making money. It's more important to uh, think about how do I make enough money so I can do the things I want to be doing to be happy. I think that's the, you don't want to lose that perspective. Good stuff. I appreciate you uh, taking some time out, Ross, and, and definitely wish you uh, continued success with, uh, with all you're doing. And, and uh, it's been a lot of fun. Thanks, Mark. And good luck. And thanks for having me. Thank you for listening to the Motivated to Lead podcast. Please subscribe on iTunes. You can also see a video version of this interview at motivatedtolead.com. This podcast is brought to you by SEMA Partners, helping you find your next great leader.